Hi, this is Bob Scully, and welcome to another edition of The World Show, Entrepreneurs of the Fiera Series. This week, one of the greatest entrepreneurs in North America in the field of transport, trucking, logistics, Louis Tulaney, owner of Transax, a company he started many years ago, started very modestly, but today it has over a thousand trucks. Those trucks from Chicago, Vancouver, all over, drive enough mileage in a week to go 120 times around the world in a single week. And he's a man who has a great sense of humor about his success. When our senior editor was asking him about banks, he said, the banks never turned me down. I should have asked for more money. He's a man with great wisdom as well, something that he gets, I think, from his old world background in his native Tuscany, where today he is one of the most prestigious winemakers. But we go back to Tuscany for something far more modest and moving, his beginnings and the day he left. Here's Louis Tolani, Pier Luigi Tolani. Louis Tulaney, we're going to tell your story today, but you've already told it very, very well in a speech you gave, which I have right here. And I've taken a paragraph out of that, which I'd like to read to the viewers to give them an idea of how the story begins. When I left Italy for Canada, I was 19 years old. I had to catch a train at 7 in the morning. The walk from my house to the train was about half an hour. It was June 27th, and the sun rose at 5.30 in the morning. So I left at 5 before anyone got up. That way I didn't have to say goodbye to anyone. I was walking away from the house, and my back was to the window of the second floor. I knew my father had heard me getting up. I knew he was at the window watching me leave, with the hope that I would turn around and wave goodbye. I never did. I knew how difficult it was for him to say goodbye to his only son with a one-way ticket going to Canada. This was the longest mile of my life. I thought about turning around, but I was saying to myself, I will never, never be poor again. I will never eat polenta. I will never drink bad wine. And someday I will come back and make the best wine in Italy. This was the beginning of my journey, my adversities, and my luck. I had never been away from home. I landed in Toronto and didn't speak a word of English. And I'm sure as I read this that the memory comes back to you as well. I could write a book on that. Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, Did your father ever live to see some of your success? Some. Not much. No, no, not much, really, but some. He was doing well. He was happy. But you did go back. Oh, yeah, I went back. Uh, the first time I was here for six years, I went back in 61. And then I went back about every two years, you know, took the children there. And, and the beginnings are always quite important. You didn't speak a word of English. No. What, uh, what kind of work did you do? What profession? I was washing, di well, washing dishes and washing floors and washing cars. No English needed. No, no English needed for that, no. And soon you had one truck. Well, then I, then I went to work in oil fields. Yeah, in, in, in Verdon, just west of here. East uh, Manitoba in eastern Saskatchewan. Near the, near the North Dakota border. Yeah, and uh, this Manitoba Saskatchewan border. At the time, I was drilling there for oil, so I got a job on the oil rig as so a roughneck. Mm -hmm. And that's when I bought my first truck. And weren't you shipping livestock at some point? No, no, then it became later. My first truck I bought was uh, to all sold water, water to the rig. So what, because each, each uh, rig needs a truck to hold water, even today. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was working in rig, uh, getting paid by the hour, and then I was working with the truck, getting paid by the day. That's when I started to make some money. And, and eventually you went up to three or four trucks. Well, no, then, yeah, then I had a truck for quite a few, couple of years, two, three years, and then I, I got into the freight business, you know, the, the, what mm -hmm. the freight we're in today. In 1960, I don't say in a speech, but 1963, I had uh, $25,000 saved in the bank. Wow. And I had my car paid for, my truck paid for, my furniture paid for, and $25,000 in the bank cash. We always imagine that for entrepreneurs starting like that, cash is going to be the problem, not the solution, and they're going to have problems with their bankers, and that's why our senior editor, Francine Blaze, when she was doing the pre-interview with you, she asked you about that, and you said, no, no, I never had a problem with, with banks. How come? No, no, I never had a problem because, you know, in my mind, I, uh, I did a good day's work, and I got a good day's pay, 
you know. So I, I you know, but then when I look back, probably I never asked for enough money. I should ask for more money, <laughs> you know. But I never, you know, I asked for some and I got and asked for some more and, and they give it to you if it, if they trust you, believe you, they give it to you. No if you paid back on time. Oh, then. naturally. And you know, one thing I learned that uh, if I uh, needed a thousand dollars and I, I thought I could pay it back, needed needed one could, could, could back, uh, pay in two year in in one year, you know, I always try to pay sooner. So when when you pay, you know, your your the money is sure the bank sooner they get they get really <laughs> of impressed. Of course, and then then they really like you. Yeah. But uh, it's funny because you drew up a list at some point of the things you need to succeed in business, and financing is not one of them. Not for me. Finance has never been a problem for me. So probably, probably because I never asked too much. Maybe that's why. So, are you the, that quintessential guy that uh, that the banks uh, who doesn't want financing? So the banks run after him. They want to lend to him. Well, no, in those days, in those <laughs> days it was tough. You know, the banking system was different. You know, they were, the banks didn't give too much money to to the trucking people. We had to go finance companies in those days. You know, Our money in those days was hard to get, and it's now now it's easy. No, it's very easy. But the concept is the same. If, uh, if uh, they know that you pay them back, they give it to you. I, I quoted from your, from your story um, because it's such a beautiful passage where you leave home in, in, in the morning. Um, but somewhere else in that, in that article, you also say that uh, you're from Luca, Tuscany, a place where today people pay fortunes to eat polenta. Yeah, sure. Good <laughs> and luck. to live in old houses I that have no plumbing. I never, I never tasted it again since I left. Yeah, because <laughs> it was a poor man's dish. Yes, and and you also say uh, you I'm from Luca in Tuscany, and we were peasants. Oh, uh, sure, that's what we were. And you also say it, it was no fun. No, it's not fun. You know. Um, in Canada and the United States, we talk about, I talk about the poverty line. Eh? Mm -hmm. That's a joke. From where I come from, I mean, that's okay. The world is different, but the, my poverty line was a lot different than the poverty line today. And I, and I have talked to other Italian immigrants from the same period, uh, and I was struck um, uh, that they were at pains to describe how hard it was after the war. Well, why would you leave your home if you, you know, if you have a job and if you make money, if everything's fine? Mm -hmm. All the immigrants left because uh, things were not good where they were. They all left for something better. And and it, it certainly was hard scrabble. But you also get the impression uh, that people had concluded that there was no future there. Exactly. When I got to be nineteen, so what, what, what's going to happen here? You know, look what kind of ship we're in, and you know, so what? Nothing to lose. Nothing and to lose. You you had an uncle. Who uh, in Verdun in Manitoba? Yeah. Who I believe was your father's brother. Yep, my father worked uh, for the Canadian Pacific in the twenties. He had come already. Brother. Yeah, yeah. Had come in return. But then my father went back to Italy to take care of his, to take care of his parents, because you know Italians take care of their yeah, parents. Yeah, that's right. They, yeah. And uh, but my father and my uncle they were not very you know those family feuds they're never very close. So I didn't tell my uncle I was coming. I, I was I wanted to do it myself like uh, all other thousands and thousands of immigrants before me had done it. And so I didn't tell him I was coming, so I went to Toronto. Then he sent me a telegram to go and visit him. That's why that's how I how That's I, how you started with the oil rigs. I learned in bird and washing dishes and washing cars and and a funny thing, your father um, I get the impression from reading that your father regretted going back to Italy. Some immigrants don't like their new home and they go back, period. But that wasn't his case. When it was hot and, you know, like we didn't have any, have any tools, uh, just uh, manual tools and mm -hmm. working the farm was hard. And many times he said, I wish I stayed in Canada. And I wish I stayed in Canada. And he described Canada as a vast land. With, with lots of food, food, he said. A lot of food. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't realize until I got west of Winnipeg, then I realized what uh, what my father meant. was talking about. Canada was the, was the granary of, uh, of the Western world after the war. No idea what, uh, when I saw those priorities, my God. But, yeah. you know. but uh, I'm thinking uh, it's when your father started saying, I wish I were back in Canada, that he planted the seed in your mind, maybe. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it would have been natural for you to start by working for your uncle, but, but you didn't want that. You wanted to do it on your own. I wanted on my own. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. 
And, and trucking, did you sort of get into that by accident? No, no, no. No, listen, when you, when you, when you don't speak, when you don't write, when you don't read, your chances are not very many. Mm -hmm. you no, know, my grandson just graduated from university and said, Grandpa, I can do this, I can do that. I said, good for you, man, aren't you lucky? And so I think my choices weren't that many. Driving a truck was uh, one job, but they didn't, they didn't know education. In the interim, uh, that's when you learned English. I learned English and you know, I learned to read and write, you know, and speak, I guess. Someday when I sell, when I retire, I'm going to go to university and, <laughs> and get command of the English language. Yeah, but you know, if, <laughs> if you go to university, they're going to want you to teach business. Not English. Not English. Not English. I want to learn. I, I, want you, you to teach You people business. don't realize what, uh, what it is not to have command of the English language. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a big minus. At the beginning, yes, I'm uh, sure. Even now. But you have it now? Yeah, but still, you know, I'm not as good as... You'd like. I'd like to be in English. Uh, meanwhile, you haven't done so badly with, with trucks because, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you own the largest independent uh, trucking company in Canada, right? Yeah. And one of the biggest, one of the top five in North America. No, top 50. We're not top 52, 50? I think. 51, oh, I 52. Still, though. No, okay. I'm not complaining. But I could have done better, perhaps. And, and to stay with numbers, uh, another, another number that struck me is um, that your trucks transport in one week over 5 million pounds of beef, pork, and poultry. Um, that's, that's an incredible, uh, is that a record? Oh, well, we're the biggest refrigerator company. You know, not in, you know, I don't know where we fit in North America, certainly in Canada, but um, we, we, we're big in the food business. And how did you conglomerate that? How did you build it? Uh, did you grow by acquisition? You have over a thousand trucks. Yeah, about 1,700. Uh, we, we made a few small acquisitions, but mostly by growth, word to mouth. You know? I never spent a, a, a cent in a dollar in a advertising, you know, just word to mouth. Big, uh, biggest customer at Fortune 500, you know, Kraft Food and Unilever you know, and Cargill and and uh, Procter and Gamble, all started with one load a week. And did you do the sales calls oh, for yeah. that? In the 90s, that's all. So your English was good enough for sales calls? Well, <laughs> but uh, you know, I guess it's understood, you know, and yeah. the people understood, you know, understood me, you know, and, and uh, I'm not a flamboyant, you know, you gotta, you gotta be humble, you yes. gotta be a little humble. Yes. I read a book uh, from uh, Andy Groves um, yes. Paranoid, only paranoid to survive, and there's was, was a passage that really stuck in my mind, and I use it often. It says, uh, only the ones humble enough to contemplate the unpleasant truth will long survive. Mm. And that's so true. It certainly and, is. Uh, and I used it many times, and it, it's helped me out. What's funny, too, is that we, we, we tend to romanticize the classic immigrant story, especially when it starts in Italy, because Italy is such a beautiful country. But you point out that when you were born there, living there, uh, and, and you're quite poor, and you're making wine uh, with your feet, because that's the only, that's the only thing you can afford to do, um, it may sound old-fashioned and, and, and romantic, but actually it's a heck of a lot of work. It's hard work. Today you make your own wine. Yeah, but not with my feet. No, that's it. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, no. Ask. no we, have, we have a state-of-the-art winery. And where is it? In Siena. Ah, in Siena, so yeah. you go, you outside go back. Siena. Yeah. yeah, so you go back quite a bit. Oh yeah, I go back every month in the summer. And when you go back, you must have a lot of Kumpari and Cugini who come around and say, "Hey, how can I do this? What you did?" Oh yeah, they have like, yeah, I was still a lot of relatives. Them, one of my sisters still there, a lot of cousins, Cugini, yeah. And do some of them want to, uh, to to do as you did and and uh, and emigrate and come over here? No, no. no. There's less emigration no, now. Yeah, but oh, they, no, they, you know, they don't, their life is pretty good. Mm -hmm. if, I, my, if my, my life was uh, like the, uh, today in Italy, probably I wouldn't have left. Yeah, that's right. What What's interesting as well is that in trucking, what economists call the barrier to entry is low. So you had one truck and you made a living. Then you had three or four trucks and made a good living. Um, but to get to a thousand trucks, that's a different matter in, in a market like this. There must be, because in your wake, there'll be loads and loads and loads of smaller competitors. Yeah, but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta understand one thing. You gotta, you gotta do things better and cheaper than your, than your competitor. 
in mm. any business, really. Mm -hmm. You've got to find a way to do it better and cheaper. Which than, are almost, than your competitor. which are contradictory. Exactly. exactly, exactly. But even today, if you can do any, in any business, if you can do things better and cheaper, you're going to succeed. You also invest more. I've noticed that, for instance, in the, in the case of the maintenance of the trucks, you do it preemptively. You spend ahead of the problem. We try to do preventive, yes. Why? Uh, because, you know, look, in, uh, you know, look at the airplanes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> true. And it's not the same thing, but, you know, bringing down on the road is very expensive, especially when you have a lot of meat that you have to deliver it, uh, Monday morning at 7 o'clock in New York. You know, uh, you've got to be there. But that, that takes capital uh, to be able to invest preemptively. It's very expensive. Yeah, but savings do in the long, in the long term, eh? No, no, it's more savings. And how are you with the troops? Because you've got it's over 1,000 trucks, 1,700, I think, uh, you're up to now. So that's, uh, that's at least 2,000 drivers. So how do you deal with all of them? Do, do you get them together in a convention a couple of times a year? Yeah, once a year we have a safety banquet in each, in each city, in Winnipeg, in Toronto, Calgary. Mm -hmm. We recognize the, the drivers for safety, one year, two years, five years. And we have people, I still have people that have been on me for 32 years. Wow. Yeah, we have about half a dozen yet. And are you uh, recession proof or recession sensitive? For instance, in 08, when all those big companies ran into big trouble, um, did that transfer over to you? Yeah, yeah, we did. We feel we feel that, you know, we go with the economy. People don't spend money; goods don't mm -hmm. move. Goods don't move. Really. But did it push you to the brink, or? No, 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 no. It slowed down. We felt the pinch. No, no, no. We're financially sound. There's no danger of that. Have you ever had a dramatic situation? Because uh, when we think about trucking as a business, um, there's danger there. And we, you know, we, uh, given the number of trucks and drivers you've got, one could imagine, you know, a pileup or a major accident or, or a, a driver loses his life. Did, did any of that ever happen to you? Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, some casualties, you know, thank God not too many. But, uh, you know, when you've got uh, 2,000 drivers on the road, you're bound to mm -hmm. have some problems. But casualty, thank God, we haven't had any for quite a few years now. There's a debate going on, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed in the papers, with, with airlines um, because of these accidents that occur that are spectacular. Um, there's pressure now to have some kind of camera in the cockpit over the pilot's shoulders that would monitor them throughout the flight and it would be live streamed down to air traffic control so that uh, they would know immediately if something's wrong or if something's happening that shouldn't be happening. And the pilots are resisting. They're saying, no, 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 we don't want constant surveillance like that. Um, it's not fair. And yet I'm told that truck drivers do have that already and that you, for instance, you have the GPS, you have the, um, you have the, um, the audio feed, you have you know, practically everything. Um, is that a fact, and, and are, are the drivers comfortable with it? Oh, yes. Now, yes. Yes. It's a way of life that's coming. They get used to it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit more efficient. It's progress. Technology. we got to use as much as we can to be efficient, to stay on top. We've got to use all the technologies available to us. And how long did you stay at the wheel? Oh, I, my last trip was, uh, I think, uh, I used to drive I used to, drive to Toronto, I used to to Toronto from Brandon, and I left Brandon at uh, Thursday, drive the truck, go over and unload, and then on Monday I put my suit on and go and go knocking on doors and, and sell freight. I didn't have any, I didn't have any schooling about selling freight when you, no. when you have to make the payments at the end of the month. You learn fast. Yeah, you're not kidding. You don't need to go to school to learn sales. You learn fast. But I would think you'd be a very good salesman. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. But I, when I was selling, I got some business, so it must be. <laughs> and and uh, Brandon to Toronto, that's quite the trip. That's like from Minneapolis to, uh, to New York City. Um, how how uh, how was it? That was a, did you did you have a kind of a final trip? Was it as bad as leaving home? Did you feel nostalgic? No, no. Actually, I was glad. I was glad. I was never. I never liked driving a truck. Oh no. No, no. Oh. I did it because it was a need. It was a way. Yeah. You know, I never, never driving a truck is a it takes different people. You know, I wasn't on my strength. 
You're, you're very much a cross-border company, of course, going back and forth constantly with a great deal of, uh, of vehicles and, and material. Um, and we hear that the border has been hardened. Uh, we know it's been hardened, but we hear that it's become very bureaucratic. They seal the containers. There's lots of paperwork. Um, how is that? It's just not a big problem. It's a little, it slows us down a bit, but they got to do it. I, you know, it's, not, it's nothing serious. Nothing serious for us, in a way. Not for transactions. You live with it and... Oh, yeah. You have to live with it. And those are the rules, and you've got to obey them, and, and you keep on. But it's not a big problem. There are also rumors that, that this industry is regularly decimated by price wars. Nobody knows how it starts, but one company starts it, and then the others follow, and it all goes downhill. Oh, yeah. Still the same. Yeah. You know? But, you know, we have, we, got to, we have to set capacity. we got to talk, you know, and that's why Procter & Gamble and... Kraft, uh, Unilever, and, you know, Holy Meal, Cargill. Those are nice customers to have. Yeah, well, they want capacity. That's really who we focus on. In other words, there is a barrier to entry for those guys. They, they could never service that kind of customer with 20 trucks. No, or 20. No, exactly. Yeah. And does the work come in spurts where at some point um, you run out of trucks? There's just so much to, to move, so many goods to move. And then other times the trucks all sit empty because there's nothing? Yeah, sometimes it does. Yeah. January, it slows down, so we have too many trucks. And, uh, you know, before Christmas, we don't have enough. Halloween, we don't have enough. <laughs> you know, so. It's like the, uh, the firemen in the firehouse uh, repairing toys during the downtime. <laughs> well, yeah, kind of, yeah. kind of. And what's the lesson from, from your entrepreneurial story? It's, it's a beautiful story, and as we pointed out, it started very, very hard. Um, but it has worked. So what's the lesson according to you? Well, my, my you know, okay, my, I really have no fears because I have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. The only fear I've had uh, is, is poverty, which probably the people don't have today, mm -hmm. which is great. But you got to have a dream. You know, mm -hmm. every, everybody dreams of being a millionaire, but very few can do it. Yeah. Because also you've got to have a vision. And you got to be willing to make sacrifices. It's not easy. You know, to be in business and be su and successful is not easy. And you got to have people. You gotta That's have it. People. You, you, in your they, literature, they, you point that out they, a lot. The most important thing is people. You have this list um, of, of the keys to succeeding in business, and, uh, and like we were saying, and financing's not on there, but people keeps coming up. It's a key. People is a key. And passion, you get people with passion. If you have no passion, you won't work. Be mediocre business, I think. So you must have occhio, oh. the eye. You must know how to pick people. Oh, yeah, but uh, that's difficult. It's, you know, yeah, we have some good people. I've made a lot of mistakes, but I made a lot of good hires too. But a lot of the people, like all my managers, I made, I made it myself all from school. Hmm. All from school. The key, the key six people all from school. Really? Uh, yeah, 25, 30 years. Six and it worked? It worked, yeah. So, Louis Delaney, um, long may you continue to inspire entrepreneurs as you've been doing, and, and long life to you and to the company. Thank you very much. Pierre Luigi Tolani, Louis Tolani. And now here's someone else coming up on The World Show. I had high expectations. Uh, in 85 and 86, even partially in 87. And then I realized that Gorbachev's plans were not uh, going to work because all he wanted to do is to preserve the system. Mm. Uh, Gorbachev's uh, famous statement was that his dream uh, was to um, have socialism with a human face. Uh -huh. And uh, my instant reaction was that Frankenstein also had a human face. <laughs> yeah. And uh, um, I, uh, I was highly critical of his actions in 88, in 89, and especially in 1990, because he did absolutely nothing to stop pogroms in, in Baku. Uh, uh, and uh, I believe that he uh, was partially you know, involved in uh, inciting this national hatred in the suburbs of the Soviet Union, uh, trying to sort of balance his power. Because all he did is just, you know, he moved, you know, from one side to another side. So if you, you could see the liberals, quote unquote, in the Communist Party mm -hmm. were getting an upper hand, he moved to the, uh, to the other side. And so it was all about staying in power, clinging to power, rather than about 
uh, genuine reforms. So that's why I, I was always critical of him. And I think the overall um, result of Gorbachev's rule, in my view, uh, was not a positive one, though I, I understand many people in Eastern Europe or in the, or, or in, in the United States mm -hmm. would disagree. Pierluigi Tolani, Louis Tolani, was our guest this week on Entrepreneurs the Fiera series of the World Show. I'm Bob Scully. Have a great week. Thanks. Mm -hmm.